it's good to be with you. Uh, I look out here, know some of you from Boy Scouts, uh, know some of you from South Carolina, went to school, Trevecca with some of you. My neighbor, didn't know that, right across the street from me. So uh, it's, uh, it's good to, to be here. Yeah, I've been retired four years, that's a long time. And, uh, uh, now, if things don't seem right, it's already going wrong. Uh, birds, projection. We were just talking about how stuff doesn't work. And then I get up to speak and half the congregation leaves. So <laughs> I, I don't have... So if, if things don't go right, I'll tell you why. Uh, since I've known some of you, I, I was out hiking on Appalachian Trail and come in and had to have my gallbladder removed. And then I was moving from a parsonage to my own house, and end up with W, had to have a hernia, two hernias removed. Then all of a sudden a big old vein come up on me, I had to have it removed. And uh, then I had to have both of my knees changed at the same day, and that was fun. Then I had seven blockages in my heart, and I had to have those removed. And then, then the last thing, I ended up in an aggressive tumor and had to have my prostate removed. So I'm just not all here today if uh, things don't go right. So I thought I'd let you know that. <laughs> then I, I see you had such a dynamic pastor uh, and, and Sparrow and his preaching. Then you've had Juneman and uh, Bertner fill in. And then, man, you filled in. So uh, it's kind of like when I was growing up, uh, I ate a lot of bologna and, uh, and peanut butter. And I'll never forget the first time I got prime rib. Wow. I always thought bologna and peanut butter was pretty good. That's what my mom told me. But when I finally got some prime rib, I found, well, y'all been listening to prime rib. You get some bologna and peanut butter today. So, so just hang with us then. Uh, do we have the scripture? Is it going to, it's going to work. Okay. Uh, Luke, the 14th chapter, verse 16 through 20. Yeah, incidentally, one of your former pastors, uh, Jimmy Blackman, I was his pastor uh, when he was a young teenager, when he was a teenager. Oh, Luke 14, starting with verse 16. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everyone, everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just brought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. Please excuse me. He may have been the only legitimate <laughs> excuse. Excuses. Excuses. I, I ran across these. I like these. These are excuses that teachers have collected over the years. And you, some of them you have to read to understand them. My son is under a doctor's care and should not take PE today. Please execute him. <laughs> Please excuse Lisa for being absent. She was sick and I had her shot. <laughs> Dear school, please excuse, and, and see how they spelled it. Please excuse John from being absent on January 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st, 32nd, and 33rd. <laughs> please excuse Roland from PE for a few days. Yesterday he fell out a tree and misplaced his hip. Here's another one the teacher got. John has been absent because he had two teeth taken out of his face. <laughs> Pictures that need to go with these. Megan could not come to school today because she has been bothered by very close veins. <laughs> Think about it. Please excuse Ray from school. He has very loose vowels. <laughs> oh, me. Please excuse Tommy for being absent yesterday. He had diarrhea and his boots leak, and I can't figure that one out. <laughs> Where did, uh, 
my mind runs a mile a minute here on these. Please excuse Jimmy for being. It's his father's fault. <laughs> uh, men absent, but I kept Billy home because uh, she had to go Christmas shopping because I don't know what size she wears. Please excuse Jennifer for, and I've heard this for church, really. Please excuse Jennifer for missing school yesterday. We forgot to get the Sunday paper off the porch, and when we found it Monday, we thought it was Sunday. <laughs> oh, me. Oh, oh, just a couple more silliness here. For not doing their homework, I made a paper plane out of it, and it got hijacked. <laughs> I put it in a safe, and we lost the combination. I loaned it to a friend, and he suddenly moved away. My little sister ate it. I heard of dogs. All of a, a sudden wind blew it out of my hand and I never saw it again, the homework. The lights in our house went out and I had to burn it to get enough light to see the fuse box. <laughs> I like that one. I used it to fill a hole in my shoe and you wouldn't want it now. Uh, my father had a nervous breakdown and he cut it up into paper dolls. Uh, I didn't do it because I didn't want the other kids to look bad. Well, excuses. Excuses. You know when excuses started? Adam. All started with Adam. Adam sinned and he tried to excuse himself. The woman you gave me. Then Eve even blamed it on Satan. God, Adam basically blamed it on God. Eve blamed it on Satan. And down to the day, men and women make excuses for not serving God. There's no unsaved person that doesn't have an excuse. Everybody's got it. These men in this parable had all kinds of excuses. Now, you've got to remember, they, they weren't invited to a funeral they, or to hear some dry sermon or to visit a hospital or go to prison. They were invited down to the Red Lobster for a buffet. And this morning, you have an invitation from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, God's only Son, to come. And I can't understand why anybody would, would ask to be excused from the mansions which Christ has prepared. I can't understand why anyone rejects salvation from all the sins where all the guilt is removed and there's peace in the depths of our heart. Why would anyone make an excuse? to turn that down. What were these men's excuses? One said, I bought a piece of ground. He'd already bought it. Who buys property without going to look to it, looking at it? The deal was made, yet he had to go see it. Strange time to go at supper time. This could have been just a downright right lie. He could have just simply been lying. He didn't want to go to the feast. And after all these years of pastoring, I've come to the conclusion a lot of people aren't surrendered to Jesus because they just don't want to. They just don't want to. Or he may have been distracted by his material possessions. So he allowed the claims of business to have priority over the claims of God. It's still possible for a man to be so immersed in this world that he has no time for the things of God and the excuses build. Another brought five yoke of oxen. Well, why didn't he prove them before he bought them? It, it often happens that when, when people enter into a new possession, they become so involved with them that the claims of the gospel, the claims of worship, the claims of God get crowded out. It's so easy for a new game and a new hobby or a new friendship to take up God's time. And we make excuses. Heard the story that when Dr. Robert G. Lee, now you probably don't, does anybody know, who, you ought to know, who, but I won't ask you. He pastored Bellevue Baptist in Memphis for years and years and years. He was born in my wife's hometown of Fort Mill, South Carolina. He was a dynamic preacher. And he was kind of, kind of a character. 
Uh, and I heard that when he was pastoring uh, Bellevue in Memphis, there, there was a young man in the church, he just called Bob, who, who became quite successful. And Bob and his young family attended faithfully, and they, and they served at the church there. Bob was a business genius and started a, a single one retail store that was so successful he expanded it and built a lot of other stores, and he'd become very wealthy. However, as his business uh, grew, he never had time for God. He just didn't have time. And, 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 and Dr. Lee said Bob and his family showed up about once a month, and they quit working and doing all the children's work and the other stuff that they were doing. And, and Dr. Lee was pretty bold. And, and so he went to Bob's office one day, and he walked right in past the receptionist, and Bob, uh, and Bob uh, saw him coming into his office, and he was surprised. Well, Dr. Lee, good to see you. Dr. Lee said, Bob, I've come by to pray for your business today. Bob, uh, Bob stammered. Well, sure. And they got down on their knees right there in his office to pray. Then Dr. Lee started to pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you'll make Bob's business fail. That call, and that caused Bob to kind of jerk up, <laughs> wouldn't me? And Dr. Lee continued. I pray that you take away all those other stores and just give him his original store because you remember, Lord, how much he loved you and served you back before he got too busy for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Bob said, well, Dr. Lee, I, I didn't like that prayer. And Dr. Lee said, that's okay, Bob. I wasn't talking to you anyway. See you in church Sunday. And that prayer got Bob's attention. And he started making God the center of his life. Excuses. The other married a wife. Well, why not take her along? Fact is, he didn't want to go. It's one of the tragedies of life when good things, the best things, can crowd God out of our life. And we must be careful. The good things of life, none of it was bad, but it crowded God out of their life. Well, those were biblical excuses. Have men got any better excuses today? Well, if they don't, and if you're here and you've been making excuses and are brent out, I've got a couple for you. Have you got an excuse that will stand the light of eternity? Have an excuse that will even satisfy yourself. Here are some excuses. I don't like the preacher. Now, you're in the process of finding a new pastor. I don't like the preacher. Well, after hundreds of years, they have found the perfect preacher. So you may want to put this on the list when you're looking for a new pastor. A model preacher, a preacher preaches 20 minutes, and he sits down. He condemns sin and never hurts anybody's feelings. He works from 8 in the morning to 10 at night in every type of work from preaching to custodial work. He makes $60 a week, wears good clothes, buys good books regularly, has a nice family, drives a good car, and gives $100 a week to the church. He also stands ready to contribute to every good work that comes along. He's 26 years old and he's been preaching for 30 years. These wouldn't be so funny if they wasn't so true. He's tall and short and thin and heavy, said. He has one brown eye and one blue eye and hair parted down the middle. The left side's dark and straight and the right side's brown and uh, tan and uh, blonde and wavy. He has a burning desire to work with teenagers and spends all of his time with the older folks. He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his work. 
He makes 15 calls a day on church members, spends all of his time evangelizing the unchurched, and is never out of his office. That's the perfect preacher. So is there going to be a perfect preacher? No. No. But I don't like the preacher. I, I, I was pastoring in uh, South Carolina, and uh, I've been going through all of my church, all of my slides. Y'all know what slides are? You should take slides. I've gone through over 5,000 slides in the last two weeks and made them digital. Uh, it's been a sad journey because <laughs> I got old <laughs> from, from those days. But I, I was looking, and, and it was a, a McGinnis family that was going to one of my churches, and, uh, and they had a little boy about two years old. He just marched in my office one day, just as just as upright as could be, we don't like you, and walked out. I wonder where he heard that, was what I wanted to know. Well, I don't like the preacher. Sometimes two-year-olds will tell you, sometimes older people will. But what in the world does that have to do with the price of eggs in China anyway, if you like the preacher or not? Suppose you, the FedEx man brings you a message from your wife, you could care less about the delivery man. It's the message that matters. The question is, are you willing to receive the message from God? If you're going to wait until you find some perfect man or woman to bring the, the invitation, you'll never accept it. Well, there are too many things I can't understand. You know, I've graduated from Trevecca twice and uh, two different degrees. I'm going to Sunday school class now that Dr. Dunning teaches and uh, Nina Gunner and Moody Gunner and Thomas Johnson. All of them teach that class. And June, John Juman and, uh, and uh, Steve Hoskin. That's my teachers. I thought I pretty well had it figured out in 45 years of pastoring. Now I don't think I know anything. I wouldn't dare answer a question in that class. I tell you, I don't care who you are. If you're waiting to understand salvation, you'll never get saved. You never will. There's no doubt about it. it is, things can be complicated in the Bible, but salvation is very plain. It's a thing of faith. I accept Jesus by faith. I don't have to understand everything. I really don't. Well, I enjoy having a good time. That's why I haven't committed to Christ. But I can tell you, don't believe the devil's lie any longer. You'll never have more true pleasure or peace or joy or comfort until you have Jesus in the very center of your life. Well, it's too hard to be a Christian in the world we're living in. It's just hard. You know, it's easy to, to, to serve someone you love. Just fall in love with Jesus. Just every day fall in love with Jesus. It's easy to follow him then. Well, preacher, you don't know how many hypocrites are at my church. Come to Christ first. Then we can talk about there have always been hypocrites in the church, and there will always be hypocrites in the church. One of the disciples was. But if you don't accept the invitation, you'll spend eternity with hypocrites. Well, people a lot of times have the excuse, well, I'm already good enough. I don't need to become saved. I don't need to give my life to Jesus Christ. I'm good enough. I don't do many things wrong. I don't smoke and chew and run around with girls that do. I'm, I'm pretty good. And I go to church. But in Isaiah, he said, all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Don't use the excuse that I'm already good enough. I don't do what everybody else does. But on the opposite of that, I hear people give the excuse... I'm just too bad. You just don't know what all I've done. You don't know how bad I've been. 
And if the devil cannot make a man believe he's good enough without being saved, he'll try to tell him he's too bad to get saved. But nobody is too bad for the blood of Jesus Christ to save them from their sins. Nobody. Well, I'm afraid I won't stick with it. Around the altar, I've heard over these years, I've heard so many people, well, I'm just, I'm just not going to surrender. I'm just afraid I won't stick with it. Well, aren't you glad a, a baby learning to walk doesn't quit? If they fall, they get up. You trust, trust Christ to save you now. And if he can save you today, he can keep you tomorrow. It's, it's just that simple. Well, excuses. If it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. That is the mantra today. All roads lead to heaven. No, they don't. Satan uses this excuse more than any other to send people to hell. You may have faith, but unless your faith is in Jesus Christ and Christ alone, you won't be saved. So don't let the excuse, well, it doesn't matter as long as you believe and you're real sincere. And then the final excuse, and I've heard it so, so many times. I have plenty of time. I'll never forget in Lawrenceville, Georgia, when I was pastoring there, a lady, they were, they were such a sweet family, but we had a great service one morning and God's power was there and people were coming to the altar and being saved and, and she walked out the door and she said, you know, I'm real close. I'm going to do that one day. Would you pray for me? And I buried her before the next Sunday. I don't tell that as one of those scare stories, but it brought so close to me the fact that we, we may think we've just got enough time to get this thing straight with God. But we don't. After having a couple of heart attacks, attacks it dawned on me that, that I am just simply one heartbeat away from eternity. Just, just one heartbeat. Age doesn't have anything to do with it. Sincerity doesn't have anything to do with it. But to say that I have plenty of time, no. So this morning... Let's write out our excuse to the King of Heaven. While sitting in the Church of the Nazarene in Old Hickory, Tennessee, on Sunday, February the 10th, I received a very pressing invitation from one of your servants to be present at the marriage supper of your only begotten Son. I pray that you have me excused. Would you sign that? Of course you wouldn't. Do we really want the kingdom of God if it means absolute rule of the Lord in our life? How much do we want Christ? Why are we so quick to make excuses when he invades our lives and wants to take charge of our soul and our heart? Is there the possibility that we want our relationship with him on our terms instead of his? If Christ is not your Lord right now, what is your excuse for not being all that God wants you to be? Excuses.